You can see Denmark's ubiquitous windmills however you arrive there, by air, land, or sea. Today we have 30% of all our electricity stemming from renewables, primarily wind and biomass. On the streets of Copenhagen, the Danes' commitment to living and working more sustainably has become part of their national culture. While the rest of the world comes to COP15 to learn how to reduce its carbon footprint, the people of this small Danish island called Samso already have. In the past 10 years, they've gone to 100% renewable energy and have reduced their carbon footprint by 147%. We want people to continue to consume energy, but they should be aware of where the energy comes from. For the past 10 years, Soren Hermansen has turned his agricultural community on Samso Island into an energy experiment for the rest of the country. It is now the talk of the sustainability world. Well, the real convincing aspect was that you could actually save money. The climate or the environmental impact was just kind of a positive side effect of it. Land-based windmills take care of all of Samso's local energy needs. Their community investment in offshore windmills allows them to sell energy back to the mainland to offset the island's transport costs, which still depend on oil. It's not just pure theory. It is doable in practical life. It's not that difficult. Most of the solutions that we need, they are there already. And if you use them, you can save money. Copenhagen's mayor, Klaus Bondham, is building more bike lanes and bridges and plan to convert the city's fleet of cars to all electric vehicles as part of Copenhagen's master plan to become the world's eco-metropolis by 2015. It's in our nerves or in our genes that we have an understanding that you can actually harm your surroundings if you don't uh, think about what you're doing. From the southeast in Atlanta, Georgia, which came within 90 days of losing its primary water source due to drought and poor planning. We're a community, a population who have felt we always had a lot of water. And now we're realizing that this water is a finite resource. To the southwest in El Paso, Texas, where residents are being paid to replace their water wasting lawns and old toilets to save their shrinking aquifers. When I get in the, uh, the rainfall and the snowfalls that we used to have that, that uh, you know, put, put some of this water back into these uh, aqua basins. Americans' ever-growing demands for water are exceeding its traditional sources, even in areas like the rain-drenched Pacific Northwest. Our sense of security, our reliable water supply, the thing that was absolute for 97 years is not absolute anymore. The mighty Rio Grande, once one of the great rivers of the world, is now nothing more than a dirt road separating Mexico from the United States and the Texas border. Much of the water has been diverted further upstream for agricultural needs and growing metropolitan needs for places like El Paso. This is one of the few places on Earth where you can actually hear butterflies fly. But this year, despite the way it looks and sounds, the monarch butterfly is in trouble. Eduardo Rendon says the monarch population is the lowest since he and his monitoring team started counting them by measuring the size of the breeding areas. We've been studying it for about 14 years, and this is down for about 75% below the average number that come here. Dr. Lincoln Brower's study of the shrinking butterfly population has stirred up an international hornet's nest over who is to blame. There is no question the Achilles heel of the monarch butterfly is deforestation in Mexico. The Americans and the Canadians blame the Mexicans for the decrease in the winter habitat. But there's also growing evidence of fewer monarchs coming back from the north each year. Biologist Don Perry, out on a limb, risking life in limb. All in his efforts to explore life at the top, the canopy life of a tropical rainforest. This is a remote part of our world that scientists have explored less than they have the moon. There's a certain thrill you get to uh, step out on a limb where no one has been before and, uh, and look around and see what 
what lives there. Of course, uh, to biologists, uh, the canopy offers uh, a, one of the last biotic frontiers. This is Costa Rica in Central America, where you can ride a bus through a chain of volcanoes, between two oceans, and across several climate zones in a single day. Costa Rica's diverse geography has made this tropical Camelot in Central America a sanctuary for some of the most diverse life on the planet. Don Perry uses a crossbow to lead the climbing ropes up into the treetops he will use to gain access to the jungle canopy. There he has constructed a network of tree houses, catwalks, and rope webs he uses for observing plants and animals in their unexplored habitat more than 100 feet above the ground. In the canopy, there are more species of plants and animals than any other habitat on the Earth. And all, these species are virtually unstudied, and many of them are unknown to science. You should always be on the lookout for climbing tree vipers. Snakes. Snakes. Poisonous snakes. African, Asian, Arab, Indonesian, most Malagasy are the result of intermarriages. They believe they are the origin of all the races of the world. Both pagan and Christian, they have a preoccupation with death and believe they will be reincarnated as animals to live again like lemurs in the jungle. At the southern tip of the island, the team of scientists enters the Berenty Reserve, a private sanctuary owned by a French family. Like the rest of Madagascar, it's amazingly free of predators. Even the snakes are non-poisonous. But the jungle teems with leeches, a tenacious pest, that's unavoidable throughout the island. Dr. Thomas Arpinate has lived in Madagascar for 13 years. He has recorded the movements of lemurs throughout the island by using miniature transmitters. Earlier in the week, he attached a radio collar to a lemur to see how far he would travel while foraging for food. Their piercing cries help keep a troop of lemurs together while moving through the treetops. It's also a warning to outsiders to stay away. Some Malagasy keep lemurs as pets, despite the government's prohibition on the practice. Lemurs can become so affectionate that they often die when separated from their owners. Their lower front teeth are flat like a comb, and are used to clean their soft fur. The lemur's paws are equipped with opposing digits, the precursor of the human thumb. The locals call some lemurs babakoto, meaning father-son, because of their uncanny similarities to men. Dr. Arpinate's research indicates that the lemur is indeed a vanishing species, victims of a diminishing habitat and their naturally low birth rate. <laughs> 